Are we live? We are. Wonderful. Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Vogel Ferguson, and I am thrilled to be able to be here today to share a little bit of what we've learned over the years about our experiences with uh, trauma-informed approaches and working with individuals that are experiencing homelessness, individuals and families. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to be here and share a little bit about our experiences. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and we can get started. Um, the name for this presentation, Catching the Vision for Applying a Trauma-Informed Lens. A lot of folks these days have come to us and said, you know, we're, we're learning about the 101s of trauma, but we want to know more about applying it. Um, so given that we have this audience that I have no idea who's out there and can't really do a lot of asking about things, we're going to talk a little bit about the basics so that we can kind of all get on the same page and then go more into some details about some ways of being able to apply this vision for a trauma-informed lens. As we start today, um, my usual mode of presenting is very interactive, lots of conversation. Uh, we're not going to have an opportunity to do that as much today, but I will be trying to throw out some questions. So please don't hesitate in replying and let the, let the leaders know that you have something to share. Or if you have a question, raising your hand, um, I'll look forward to being able to be more responsive to what you're looking for. Um, and, and less about just my agenda. So we know that as we experience people, or we work with people experiencing homelessness, that it's not a um, uniform population. Uh, my experience in the past has been working with those in permanent supportive housing when several years ago I was able to work with Department of Workforce Services and do some uh, research with folks from Palmer Court, Sunrise Metro, Grace Mary Manor, and Kelly Benson and uh, learned an awful lot from the staff and the, the clients at that point. Um, but we also know that there's people who come in and are just experiencing homelessness for a very short period of time. So how do we think about this trauma-informed lens across, across the board? So let's jump a little bit into just the basics so that we can talk about where we're going from here. I think it's important to start with the, the definition again, at least that we use of trauma from the American Psychological Association. Trauma is defined as the emotional response someone has to an extremely negative event. While trauma is a normal reaction to a horrible event, the effects can be so severe that they interfere with an individual's ability to live a normal life. I think the few pieces that I want to pull out of that to make sure that we pay attention to is that trauma is defined as an emotional response to a negative event. I mean, the reality is, is all of us have negative events in our lives, but not all of them become traumatic events. And actually, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, we as people working with those that might be going through some really hard times, have some capacity to help that individual either learn from the event and, and be able to move forward or have it shift in becoming a traumatic event. And so that definition of trauma is important. It's not the event itself, but it's the response that someone has to the event. And of course it is normal. It's a normal reaction because when we have a trauma response, it's about survival. And we're all trying to do things to stay alive, right? Um, so the, but the effects are severe enough that they inter interfere with an ability to live a normal life. And that normal reaction is what we're looking for when it comes to trauma. So, Here's a list of some things we consider necessarily um, potentially traumatic events. As you look through that list, is there anything that um, is either surprising or maybe um, missing from the list that you can see? Just throw out some thoughts. For those who would like to participate, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. Any thoughts? Ryan, you have been unmuted. Well, you have to unmute on your side, sorry. There you go. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, but also add uh, eviction, like, like those are very traumatic events. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving that from that place of stability into a place of being of unknown what you're going to experience. Anything else people see that maybe should be on the list 
or that's surprising on the list? What about um, miscarriage or homelessness? Absolutely, homelessness. Um, miscarriage, those are unexpected events. Those are things that, that can catch us by surprise and kind of change the direction of what we think is going to be happening in our lives. Those are great examples. Other things that people have said, um, divorce, right? Divorce can be a very traumatic event for an individual. Um, move from just a hard event to something that's traumatic. Other people have said marriage can be a traumatic event. I guess we depends on how your perspective is. Um, some people have questioned bullying or terrorism. I think 10 years ago, those may not have been on the list. Those are relatively new to our consciousness of, of how they impact people. Um, Cyberbullying, uh, we see that a huge impact, especially on young people for that. So all of these are things that are we consider potentially traumatic events in that they have the potential to create that response that can really just throw us off track and move us into a place where we're feeling unsafe. Um, these kinds of events elicit feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, loss of power, loss of control. These are all things that can be associated with traumatic events and, and can impact our reactions to things. So why does it have such a big effect on us, these traumatic events? Well, really when something has, has moved from being just a hard event into being a traumatic event, it's about survival. The individual is experiencing that event internally in a way that we would if we were out in the woods and, well, these days we would say being chased by a mountain lion, right? We've seen that in the news recently. Out in a place where we're, literally our life is on the line, our body is reacting that way. And we can respond from that fight, flight, or freeze response that, that is there to, as humans, as our instinctual human animal person trying to survive. Um, so these are things that um, then can take on outward responses, outward signs that a person is acting in one of these modes for that survival response. And a lot of times, these are the things that we end up seeing when people are expressing experiences of trauma in some behavior. And these different behaviors are sometimes difficult to interpret. Um, so we have to be able to think about what is that trauma reaction that might be behind some of the behaviors that we're seeing. So um, a trauma reaction that might be reflected in feeling unsafe might be that anxiousness or agitated, right? The uncertainty, the pacing. Um, emotional detachment might be a reflection of someone who's trying to isolate, to stay away from others. Others are unsafe. Um, people with boundary issues. I've heard lots of stories about uh, people with boundary issues. They just, they might end up invading other people's space, not understanding um, that that is a, a, a common social norm that we need to respect flashbacks and triggers can end up being reflected in outbursts, emotional or aggressive behavior. When someone just in an instant, um, one second is fine and the next second is just off the rails. You know, what's the trigger? What's the, what's the flashback that might be part of their experience at that moment? Rigidity, having to have things a certain way. Um, I'm a type A personality, so I can say I've got a lot of rigidity just in my basic nature. But there are some people that have that rigidity to the point of obsession, right? And so that can be linked back to that behavior of needing to have control, wanting to reestablish predictability in their life. And that behavior is reflecting that internal need for those kinds of experiences. Avoiding traumatic memories or thoughts can of, often be seen in the repetitive behavior or repetitive thoughts, um, almost like a mantra. If I can keep this thought, repetitive thought or repetitive behavior going, then I can keep those traumatic memories or traumatic experiences out of my brain. So all we see a lot through the rest of the list here, addictions, frustration by rules and consequences, resisting, connecting, all of these pieces can really be linked to trauma reactions that reflect an individual's um, need to try to stay safe. They're trying to move into the survival mode. And so we see these links between those emotional responses and then the behaviors that we expressed. Some of these uh, can be reactions to current experiences, but they also might be responses to past experiences that have built up through an experience of adversity throughout their life. 
Now, a lot of folks these days have talked about adverse childhood experiences or the ACEs. Uh, we're not going to go into detail with that here. If you haven't heard of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, I would suggest you look it up. It's, it's a really a key piece of understanding the link between adversity and childhood. And then as this shows in this triangle, um, that can be the foundational component that leads to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment adoption of health risk behaviors as a way of coping with some of those experiences and feelings that I don't want to feel or experience, um, leading to disease, disability, social problems, and early death. This ACEs triangle shows us that connection between childhood and some of the experiences in adulthood that are really challenging. A piece that is core to that is looking at the impact of ACEs. Um, I like this little uh, drawing here. Survival mode is supposed to help be a phase that helps save your life. It's not meant to be how you live your life. So that idea that somebody that is constantly feeling in survival mode, their, their body's constantly being overwhelmed by that adrenaline um, that says I'm in survival mode. When that happens, especially in childhood, that can actually affect brain development as well as physical health development through suppression of the immune system. So that brain and body impact of things that happen as children are often manifest in the reasons why people, some people end up experiencing homelessness because of mental health issues, because of physical health issues, inabilities to uh, maintain or retain employment. Uh, those factors can all be seen as going together. I think a piece that's been helpful more recently is this expansion of ACEs to think beyond just that childhood experience. Um, we have the, the traditional 10 ACEs that you see in the household picture in the tree here, but there's also a plethora of community adversity, adverse experiences that people can uh, go through perhaps based on some of the things that they experienced in childhood, or perhaps not. There are things that might just happen to them as they grow or in adulthood. In number three, we see environmental issues that can also add to that. And uh, we know this is a very recent graphic because the one, the bottom one on the right there is pandemic. You know, think about the impact that the pandemic has had on people that are already living on the edge, that are already living in a survival type of mode the pandemic, the earthquake, the hurricane winds, all of these pieces together have just, just built together um, to see that experience. Just briefly, because many of you are from the field, any thoughts on how the current situation has um, raised the experience or the traumatic experiences of people that you're working with? Any stories that you'd like to share about kind of your experience with that? I'd love to hear from a couple of people. Hi, hey Mary Beth, this is Matilda, and I just wanted to share, it's definitely um, the recent events have triggered a lot of trauma in our uh, clients that we're working with here, and I'm finding that a lot of people are reacting to that by completely um, shutting down and kind of, I don't know if, it, if it's hunkering down or what the word is, but we tried like a little um, outing out of our building, like socially distanced, just our core group and just being outside of our building was overwhelming. And we actually mm -hmm. had to cut it short because so many people had such negative reactions. So yeah. definitely I feel like this is affecting um, people that already have a, a high ACE score. Wow. Thanks, Matilda. Other thoughts? I'm sure there's a lot of stories out there of people that are experiencing this, this um, pileup of experiences. With Matilda's story, um, thinking back to what we talked about at the beginning of potentially traumatic events and, and the feeling that they bring of taking away a sense of control, a sense of being able to have life being predictable. Um, so it makes sense that hunkering down in the midst of something that's so far beyond anyone's control, just wanting to turn in and stay safe. That seems like a very normal, natural response to 
um, an experience that is so far beyond any of ours control. And, and I, I, I don't want to speak for everyone here, but I've noticed with myself and with my team and with my colleagues, um, many of us that have very little history of traumatic experiences ourselves are feeling these things on a really like a level that we've never felt them before. Um, that feeling of being out of control, we can't do what we're used to being able to do. And so then applying that to people who have experienced trauma and have a long history of adversity, um, you see how it could be magnified. So the idea that homelessness is co-occurring with many other issues just makes sense, right? We see that there's um, uh, the reality of homelessness that it's sel se seldom the only issue that an individual or a family is facing. There's often co-occurring factors, which actually may have been the precipitating issues that led to the homelessness to begin with. Adding homeless to the mix isn't necessarily helpful in being able to address these ideas, but the connection between the childhood adversities and adult home homelessness are very real. Some data around ACEs and homelessness that we can see. Here, ACEs and homelessness, 66% had scores of five or more of the adverse childhood experiences. 80% disclosed mental health diagnosis. 40% diagnosed learning disabilities or special education experiences. People experiencing homelessness are 10 times more likely to have lived with someone who used street drugs, had a family member incarcerated, or experienced physical abuse. So all of these connections between that early childhood experience and homelessness just suggest that there's some very deep seated some really significant issues that are driving a lot of the behaviors that we see. And specifically, as we talked around the physical and mental health issues. Another component of that, which we see in this slide relative to the, le uh, the diagnosed learning disabilities and special education, is that the experiences of, of, of adverse childhood experiences can have an impact on the executive functioning skills. And these are all of the skills that we use to be able to um, well, the fact that you were able to get onto the Zoom call at this right time and figure out your life and your other obligations so that you could be here at this time, that took a lot of executive functioning skills and even more so today when we're managing kids and home and family. Um, if somebody has had those adverse childhood experiences and it has affected their brain development significantly, these areas that we all, I think, often take for granted are pieces that can be underdeveloped in those who have those experiences. Doesn't mean that they can't be developed over time, but some of the assumptions we make around people's ability to show up for meetings on time, um, be flexible when there's change in a situation, um, take ownership and initiate things for their own lives, or having even that delayed gratification sense, all of these pieces are again, things that we have to be careful not to take, take for granted when we're talking with people that might have had those experiences that have affected those. All of this talk about ACEs and about trauma can be kind of discouraging, thinking, you know, if, if that many people have that kind of history, uh, what's going to happen today? What, what hope can we have for the future? But it's really important for us to remember that that ACE score, that history, is really just a part of history. The current reality is real today, but neither of those are destiny for individuals. There, we have to believe that there's hope in being able to move forward and that there's something we can do about being different and have things change for the future. And that's where I would suggest with this um, view of a trauma-informed approach, it's about kind of having a different lens on the world. Uh, uh, thinking about things through a trauma-informed lens means that whenever we see behavior, whenever we see activities, we're thinking about things differently. And we're thinking about how do we develop strategies to respond to the behaviors that we're seeing, not from a defensive or a punitive kind of way, but something that's informed by that trauma-informed lens. It changes the way we do a lot of things. And I'm just gonna briefly touch on three different areas that are part of that vision of change. Thinking about uh, the trauma-informed approach from an agency perspective, how can we be part of building resilience and making connections? And then what does it mean to be able to take care of ourselves as caregivers in those kinds of situations? So I want to present, I, and I think as a core for everything we do, we talk about that trauma-informed approach from a document that has been um, something that we've gone to consistently, and it's from SAMHSA for the concept of a trauma-informed approach. And they talk about it as the four R's, the four R's that outline an approach to people and systems that are trauma-informed. 
Uh, the first one, um, a trauma-informed approach realizes having knowledge and believing it is really real is part of realizing the widespread impact of trauma. We, we, it gives us the ability to accept experiences that can change body and brain in childhood and impact activities in adult living. And that this acknowledgement does not have to define a person's future, right? It can be part of the past, but doesn't have to define a future. A trauma-informed approach also recognizes um, that the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, family, and staff, and others involved in the system. But to do that, we need to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma so that we can respond with that knowledge. It's really that shift. The phrase I love is not looking at a person and saying, what's wrong with you? But it's thinking about what happened to you. It's about being able to get curious about what's behind behavior and explore that versus shaming someone or um, in Matilda's example, it's like, hey, we gave you this great opportunity to come out and be out in the open. Why aren't you taking advantage of it? What's wrong with you? Versus being able to step back and say, hmm, what happened that this behavior that we're seeing based on this experience that we thought would be good? What, what's the mismatch in this? Um, it helps us really not take things personally and recognize that the behavior really is related to something else. The third R is about responding, responding with full integrated knowledge about trauma in all of the different ways we do things on an individual agency and system level. And the goal then of seeking not to re-traumatize or even to be the initial traumatizer. Um, all of us have been part of systems that we could look back in and say, you know, I was traumatized by be being part of that organization. There were parts of that system that traumatized me and that's certainly what we, not what we wanna do with our clients. So looking at SAMHSA's document, they have 10 areas of domains within an organization where we can look at to begin to say, how can we assess our organization in these areas around how trauma informed we are? And then on the, on the right hand side, we have the six areas or key principles of a trauma informed approach. So really it's about crosswalking those domains and those principles and saying, for example, in all ways, how are we creating safety within our organization? Not just within our physical environment, but in the way that we engage with clients, around our leadership, around our financing. I think sometimes when I read letters that clients get from agencies, they can feel very threatening, very punitive. How do we create safety within even how we communicate? And down the board, how do we create trust? How do we create peer support? mutual collaboration, um, how do we engender power, voice, and choice, or respect cultural, historic, and gender differences. Each of these areas or key principles can be crossed with areas within our organization so that whenever we're designing things, we, we run those, these principles through that lens of a trauma-informed approach and apply those key principles to all areas of our organization. Some it might seem like it's quite a stretch, but I think if we have those lenses on, if we step back and look at those things, then we can begin to see what the links are like. And it's always good to be able to continue to ask ourselves questions and include clients as part of that process. So some of the questions for considering a trauma-informed approach, because it really is something that we have to own as important to our organization from the top down. And while I'm very much a grassroots person and I like seeing things bubble up from the bottom, a trauma-informed approach is something that has to start with leadership because leadership sets the tone for an entire organization. And so asking leadership some of these questions, why is becoming a trauma-informed organization valuable? Is that something that we want to engage in? Because it's gonna require some challenging things to happen. How could implementing trauma-informed care practices benefit our organization? How might we be able to make decisions differently? How might we be able to be more supportive to our clients through this kind of approach? Thinking what challenges might we encounter in our efforts to implement change and how might these challenges be overcome. It's not necessarily easy. In one level, we can learn about trauma and we can learn about um, the responses and things that happen, but actually doing a good evaluation of our organization, it can be quite challenging. Uh, because it, it, it calls us to look at basic pieces of who we are through that lens and perhaps make some changes. 
And then how do we think about this to sustain practices over time? One of the pieces that has become key in our efforts and why we continue to talk about doing it from the top down is that if all we do is inform our front line about trauma and how they should engage with their client, then we're missing all of the different levels that happen within the organization, um, how workers themselves can be traumatized by policies or practices within an organization. So beginning to ask ourselves these questions and saying, where do we want to go with this is a key piece. So our first principle of applying that trauma-informed lens is about thinking organizationally. It's the environment, it's the setting through which our clients see the world when they're engaging with us. And so that has to be a beginning first step. Getting to a kind of a more practical level for the individual, we can begin to look at then, how do we make connections? How do we build resilience and work build resilience within the organization, within our interactions with each other, and in our interactions with clients? We know that resilience and people's ability to manage difficult things is really what can make the difference between whether something is experienced as a trauma or whether it's just experienced as a hard event that I can see myself making my way through. You know, people experiencing homelessness, um, they're in a moment of adversity. And we often have the ability to influence whether or not that event can be viewed as an adversity or whether it can be overcome and before it ever becomes a traumatic event for that individual. But what do we need for me to feel safe? Um, what do you want me to bring to my toolkit or my trash can to add to the conversation? I don't know if you've ever had that example, but I know that uh, in one training, a person, to, uh, a couple where both of them worked in really difficult jobs um, they would come home at the end of the day and, and one person would start venting and the other one would say to them, you know, what do you need from me right now? Do you need me to be a toolkit or do you need me to be a trash can? Do you want me to help you fix something or do you just need to vent? And really trying to put ourselves into the place of the person that we're talking to and find out what do they need from us is a way that we're going to be able to make that connection. So we think about that relative to individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, an important quote here, homelessness deprives individuals of basic needs, exposing them to risky, unpre unpredictable environments. In short, homelessness is more than an absence of physical shelter. It is a stress-filled, dehumanizing, dangerous circumstance in which individuals are at high risk of being witness to or victims of a wide range of violent events. So all of the things that we talked about, um, the safety, the trust, the choice, the voice, all of those pieces are part of what's taken away or can be taken away through that experience of homelessness. When we talk about resilience, we're thinking about how do we build that back up? I love this definition. Resiliency is the ability to return to being whole, helpful and hopeful after bad things happen. Resiliency, when you bend with the wind, but don't break with the storm. I think in my short experience in, of working with folks um, in permanent supportive housing, um, actually both the staff and the clients, I was amazed by people's resiliency, by their ability to be able to move beyond difficult events, take those next steps and do what needed to be done. But resiliency isn't something that we can take for granted. Again, it's um, the, the brain science tells us that some people are born with just basic different levels of resiliency. So there is a genetic component. And anyone who's had more than one child seems to be able to attest to the fact that, you know, all kids don't come out the same, right? Some are more resilient. Some have more coping skills um, just from the very beginning. But for most of us, resiliency comes through our ability to be able to connect with others, that other people are really what helps us build up that resiliency and helps us to stay strong in difficult times. Anyone here familiar with uh, Oprah? She ring a bell for anyone? Well, I think she is somebody that uh, most of us know has had a very difficult, had a childhood and a number of aces off the scale that, uh, would not have predicted where she's at today. 
but there's components of resiliency that I think she speaks to and I'd like to show a short video clip of that helps us to think about how can our role, what can our role be in helping people to gain and um, own that resiliency that they can have. So we're gonna take a moment and watch this short video. A correspondent candid with Oprah Winfrey. Oprah, your story for 60 Minutes this week is about childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of new science here about trauma-informed care. For, for anyone who's dealing with a traumatized child, what can they learn from your story? Well, I think that this story is going to, it is my hope that our story on trauma-informed care will not just be impactful, but will also be revolutionary. It certainly has caused a revolution in my own life. And I was struck by the story because it reminded me of my own childhood growing up in Milwaukee. It's, it's, it's not lost on me, the irony of being back in the same city, Milwaukee, where I grew up on welfare, poor, uh, a lot of negative experiences, sexual abuse and all of that. What's the difference between a really bad childhood and being able to overcome that and a traumatic childhood and someone not being able to overcome that? Really, it boils down to something pretty simple. It and the really answer that Dr. Bruce Perry gives you is relationships. If you also have opportunities to be connected to people in positive mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. uh, that can buffer yeah. some of those effects. And, and, and as you get older... I'd like to know more about that. What, what he really means is love. He's a scientist. He's not going to use the word love. But it really is about how you are responded to, valued, mm -hmm. trusted, and loved mm -hmm. by those around you. So I didn't get it from the people who I felt I should have gotten it from. It can be anybody who cares enough about you to ask the question, what happened to you? Could you trace back in your mind, it was that person who made it? I know difference. exactly who did it. I know exactly the moment I started to feel valued. And for me, it was school. I wanted to be a fourth grade teacher because of Mrs. Duncan. And I haven't seen Mrs. Duncan since then, and Mrs. Duncan is here today. Mrs. Duncan! <laughs> the moment I felt the most value was in my fourth grade class when Mrs. Duncan said to me, I, I was the one who was chosen to lead the class and whatever it was. So what was I like? I don't, I don't really remember. Oh, I do remember you. That I was... remember you were such a fluent reader. Well, oh, if I had had a class full of students like Oprah, I would have been floating on air. So Mrs. Duncan instilled in me this sense of believing that I mattered. And that is what every human being is looking for. When you first heard that I had like done something in, in life, were, oh, did you know that it was me? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I kept it with you without your being aware of it. And it was Mrs. Duncan who helped heal you? For me, yes. It was Mrs. Duncan, and then it was my, my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Graham. It was school that made me feel a sense of value and connection. You learned a lot on this story. Oh, I learned a lot on this story. This story was life-changing for me. Life-changing, really? Life-changing. And people use that word rhetorically. Mm -hmm. Life-changing. It's changed the way I operate with, in my business, with my people, with my school. One, two, three. <laughs> you say that the most important question to ask of people who have gone through trauma is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Yeah. 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 So when you see you know, a church being shot up, or you see, you know, all of the headline-making uh, stories of people seemingly gone mad, mm -hmm. your first thought is, what happened to that person? Right. Right. You know, what has been life-changing for me um, is the question, what happened to you? Not what is wrong with you, but what happened to you? Which is an important question, not just for people who have been so-called traumatized, but it's the most important question you can ask of anyone. I can say that of all the stories I've ever done in my life and all of the experiences I've ever had and people I've interviewed, this story has had more impact on me than 
practically anything I've ever done. It's changed the way you see everyone? It's changed the way I see everyone. So when I have an employee who is acting out of line or who is just being a jerk, I don't think, what's wrong with that guy? What's wrong with that girl? What's wrong with that person? I think, I wonder what happened to them. Hmm. I wonder what happened to them. I wonder what happened that caused them to behave that way. That's what this story did for me. Okay. I think that's a, um, I always appreciate that story because that helps remind me about where we as a, a community um, can have some power, right? How can we um, be like those teachers were for Oprah to be able to move beyond the negative experience and everything else that a person's experiencing and be able to move forward, right? And, and I just love that line where she said, you know, somebody helped me feel that I mattered. And in talking with the individuals for our study, I just remember so many of them talking about feeling invisible in our community, feeling like nobody saw them, nobody cared, that they were outside a bakery when they were so hungry and there's food in the window and nobody seemed to recognize that there was a disconnect in this human being and their basic needs and what was available or not available to them. Um, so that ability to be able to just show care um, is part of what we can use for building that resilience. So in these areas, on a real practical level, we want to think about how can we be part of building this. Sometimes it seems so simple to someone with a trauma history that they would be acting out in these ways, but remember, it's about survival. Um, so good actions that we can take really can make a difference, and bad actions that we take can make a big difference as well. Um, some small slights that people experience can be experienced as a, as a life or death situation. So how do we build and think about that resilience and be part of building a difference for the future? Well, I would suggest that there's some examples. And I'm, as you see this list, I'm going to be asking you to share a little bit about your examples as well. But just to kind of get us started, because these are the real, the real practical things that we can do to build that resilience and not be part of re-traumatizing, not be part of turning adversity into trauma for individuals. So something as simple as safety. You know, people can be triggered by almost anything. We have no idea. But when we see somebody reacting, asking them was the question, you know, what was difficult about what just happened? What do you think set you off as you needed to, do, as, as now you're reacting to a situation? Um, finding out what safety means to them as an individual. I remember one of, the, uh, one of the gentlemen that we interviewed as part of our study, he was talking about when he was uh, first in permanent supportive housing, they gave him the keys to the apartment and he slept on the floor for like three months. He, he said, I didn't feel like it was going to be my place. No one's ever given me anything that they haven't just taken it right away. So I didn't want to get used to sleeping on a bed. Um, so it took him a long time to feel safe enough that that was really going to be a place that he could stay. There can be physical safety, but there can also be psychological safe, safety um, that we need to work on. What language can be perceived as threatening? Um, how do I frame things so it doesn't feel like a threat versus a conversation that is going to help someone feel more safe? Peer support is another piece that's huge. Um, so many of us, when we go through difficult times, somebody mentioned earlier about a miscarriage or when we have experiencing divorce. Right now, I'm caring for elderly parents. Um, these are things that we often don't talk about in the community. And so it, we can feel like we're all alone in these situations and that no one else has ever felt this way. So providing opportunities for people to talk about situations with each other to be able to recognize that you know, this isn't just me that's this failure in this experience, but there's other people who have had hard times too. And we can support each other in being able to move forward. Um, that in itself builds resilience within individuals and in knowing they're not alone. That, that concept of collaboration and mutuality, um, that there's clear roles and boundaries um, with roles for everyone. Everyone has a part to play no matter what kind of decision making is being done, how do I include my client as part of that? Even in very simple things, 
um, that so clearly uh, communicates mutuality and respect to an individual we can, when we can find a way to actually be a partner in a situation versus always telling, directing, um, setting rules and regulations that are so far outside, again, that people have no control over. Trustworthy and transparency. Oh, all of us love to talk about transparency in government, you know, being up front with us. But think about some of the policies and some of the rules and some of the things that we have in our organizations. Um, how predictable are our environments? How often can we reduce change so that people don't feel like the world is kind of always shifting under their feet, that they, we can't be relied on? Um, even things like privacy and confidentiality. I've been in places, um, not necessarily actually in um, places for people experiencing homelessness, but even in state agencies where, where workers are talking about other clients in front of other people, um, names are used. Um, that creates a sense of fear. Uh, if they're going to talk about other people, might they be talking about me? So how is privacy and confidentiality, just respect for that individual shown? Um, empowerment, voice, and choice. All of us like to know about uh, being part of a conversation, having choice in situations. None of us really like to be told too much how things are done. Um, I think of even kids these days, we talk about giving choices within boundaries, right? Um, do you wanna wear the blue pants or the green pants today? But one of the choices isn't going without pants. We, we always have boundaries of things, but within those boundaries, what kind of choice can we provide? Um, involving clients in designing and implementing even in evaluations when a project is done. Can we have conversations with clients afterwards? Even something as simple, I love this example someone gave once, is when you have to meet with a client to be able to ask them, okay, they're living in the homeless shelter, um, but they often have very busy schedules with different agencies and different taking buses to go places, those kinds of things, saying, you know, we need to meet. Does Tuesday or Thursday work better for you? That can be so simple, but it's about providing voice and choice for the individual. And then the last one from the SAMHSA document, the cultural, historical, and gender issues. Uh, we're learning a lot more about these today. And, and in, in the culture, the current cultural environment, it has become even more evident that we need to be attentive to these things. So learning about people that are different than ourselves, asking people questions, allowing people to talk about their experiences and how it might be different, that builds that resilience. It builds that sense that Oprah was talking about, that there's somebody who cares about me as an individual, not just just about the fact that I'm a client, but they're wanting to learn about me, maybe about my culture, about my history. It becomes personal. So as we think of these really practical ways to build resilience within individuals, I'd love to hear examples of other things that people do that build up these types of resiliency factors with individuals. I'd love to have a few people share those ideas if, if you can uh, raise your hand and, and let them call on you. Anyone have examples of these things that you've done? Matilda. <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, I think um, being seen and being heard is probably the, the number one thing that I feel is important when working with my clients, um, making sure that I, I repeat back what they're telling me at some point in the conversation so that and I've actually, some people do notice that and say, you know, they're so used to telling their story over and over again, they don't feel like they're often heard. And I think sometimes for us that are working, you know, with multiple clients in homeless services, people feel like maybe their story is so similar to so many other people that they're, they're just kind of lumped in this category instead of being seen as an individual person. And I think just acknowledging that their trauma is their trauma and it's, um, you know, it, it sounds weird to say it's unique, but, but validating that I think is super important. Yeah. There's so many times when we, when we kind of lump people together and the homeless right? And, and yet, you're right. Each individual's experience, their pathway to this moment in their life is absolutely, completely unique. 
There might be a lot of similar characteristics, but it is unique and it's important to be able to acknowledge that, their individual humanness and experience. Thanks so much. Someone else, some examples of this. That's Ryan, I think. Uh, yes, um, I was just, um, didn't want you to be up there with no one answering, so I'm just glad Matilda, <laughs> Matilda commented. Um, I, I think uh, one of the biggest things of the empowerment, voice and choice for, for you know, building uh, with my clients has always just giving them all the different options and never telling them which one that I want them to take. I asked them, what do they think, you know, is the best choice of action for, let's say, an individual who wants to apply for an apartment, someone who I'm helping get out of homelessness, and they say, you know, I want to go with this place, but I know personally that they wouldn't pass the background check. I never tell them no. I just completely support them and say, all right, let's, let, let me help you, you know, let's fill out the application, let's apply, because I never want to let my notions or what I, my jadedness, if you will, from the bureaucracy, take away someone's choice, you know, because it, to me, that's not empowering. That's just being another no person for an individual. Keep telling them, no, don't do this. No, don't go do that. Oh, it, it's almost like, um, it, it's just almost kind of disheartening for them to just, you know, come up with their own ideas and then just be constantly shut down. So I always just try to give my clients every single choice that I know is, you know, feasibly out there. And then whichever one they decide, I just back them 100%, which is what I even do with clients who are wanting to fight, let's say, an eviction. I'll, and whether I believe it's a, you know, egregious or not, I will tell them, okay, I'm contact you, call legal services. I'm going to support you if you need me to write an advocacy letter. Let's do it. No, no matter what the circumstances are, because in the end, I got to remember, this isn't my case. It is, it's their case. And I'm not here to um, run point. I'm here to provide assistance and basically resources and just more or less be supporting. So not to lead my clients, but to stand beside them. Wow, Ryan, that's a great example. Thank you. Um, because there is a tendency when we um, see this uh, ripple effect of consequences of their choice just to try to make that for them. Um, of course, we would never want to support a choice that would be harmful to the client, but really treating them with the same respect we would anyone as far as even providing those options and, and providing information. I think there's a difference between deciding for someone and helping them understand through information to say, you know, that, that is something you can do. And you might also want to know that this is going to be part of the process. And how do you think that might work for you? Right? So um, if they know they have a terrible background and uh, they're never going to pass a background check and you give them the information, that background check is going to be part of the process for this place that still leaves the choice in their hands to say if they want to go forward with something. So that respect and that acknowledgement of their individual voice and choice is there along with the information. Um, it is helpful to be able to kind of think about how do I start where the client is at? Because if we think about the challenges to the executive functioning skills that we talked about earlier, some are more capable than others actually to even have the information for the decisions. So really partnering. I love when you use that word partnering is a huge part. Looks like a, Kelly has a comment. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. I, so I work with um, aging services and, and seniors who are either homeless or, or facing homelessness. And I'm looking at several of your points here, the collaboration, trustworth, trustworthiness, and in, empowerment. And one of the things I find with the seniors sometimes is they have been through systems over and over and a lot of it feels out of their control and they feel like they have no voice in what is going on or they, they don't feel empowered to even speak to people in agencies. Some of them don't wanna come meet me down here at my office in the government center because they, they said they're scared. You know, They don't feel comfortable in, in big bureaucracies. 
So one of the things I try to do with them as much as possible, because we do so much behind the scenes on email and phone calls and paperwork that they're not seeing often is show them mm. as much as possible what I've done with them, for them, make phone calls with them, sitting there, put people on speakerphone whenever I can so that they're part of the conversation and they speak up for themselves when they can rather than me speaking for them, which which I do fairly often because sometimes those phone calls or emails happen when the client is not with me. But as much as possible, I try to encourage them to do what they can on their own behalf and, and sh show them the letters I've written and print out the emails and show them what the conversations have been so that they, under they, they trust what I'm doing, I think, because they see what I'm doing as much as I'm able to let them do that. And it, that's empowering, I think, for them. Oh, completely. That's a, that's a, that's a great example because not, maybe not so much with the elderly, but that idea of partnering with them. And even if you're the one taking the steps, showing them the steps along the way, if you're working with somebody who's maybe earlier in their process, you're also building the resilience so that someday they could do that themselves. They see how the system works. They observe and learn through that modeling that may, they may never have experienced before and then potentially can take that on themselves for the future. And, and the trustworthiness that you're, that you're talking about, if I can see that you actually do care about me, um, as Oprah said, called it love, um, that you care enough about me to take all these steps, then maybe some of the maybe it's some of the additional information that I've been holding back that's really part of what's getting in the way, I might feel more comfortable sharing that as we move forward together in our process. So each of those steps is so critical. And I think as I was preparing this, I thought, you know, what do I have to say that's that's new and innovative? But it's not really that. It's about how we apply the basic principles that we would apply to our family members, to our kids, to our spouses, that really re the respect and the partnering uh, that we want to do with our clients, that's just the, the key of, a, of an adult and adult relationship. Those are the kinds of things that we can do to build. Anyone have any other thoughts? Okay, I, I want to just to this last section in our last few minutes here, um, move a little bit from this idea of how do we build resilience uh, in, the, in the clients to thinking a little bit about ourselves. Because, you know, we all had that experience, no matter what role we are in, of being a new worker in a new place. You know, don't you love all the arms, all the enthusiasm, the energy that we have when we begin? Um, I remember actually saying this myself. Wow, I have, I love helping people. This is a dream. I can't believe they even pay me to do this great work, right? We have that enthusiasm at the beginning, um, but the work is hard. And I don't, I really don't think until you've been in it, you understand the day in and day out challenges that come with this kind of work. And so to figure out, you know, how, if I'm going to be the main person partnering with my clients, being that person that helps build the resilience, that helps partner, that helps um, recognize and respond respectfully to all of these different behaviors, how do I take care of myself so that I can continue to do that day in and day out? You know, I know too many social workers who are now doing real estate. Um, it doesn't work if we don't do something to take care of ourselves because this is the reality, right? We can't pour from an empty cup. We have to take care of ourselves in this process. And it can be very trite sometimes, this idea of self-care. Um, but the reality is secondary trauma is real. And the fact that people are going through things and we hear these stories day in and day out, it has an impact on us. Um, so just to have a, a, couple of, a couple of laughs before we we end today, I'd like to show a, a real quick video and see if you can uh, relate to anything here. Here's to you, trying to make the world a better place. You take on the weight of it all, knowing there will be a cost, but never expecting to pay full retail for it. After a while, you notice something's getting to you. You're changing. You've been there. We've all been there. The answers just aren't all that easy anymore.
now you're too drained for even the smallest demands. You're numb. You feel like you can't do enough. And you've needed a nap since before the turn of the century. Maybe you're a school teacher, a public defender, or a member of the military. So why does the world feel like a different place to you? Maybe you're an ecologist, a doctor, a community organizer, or a caretaker to family members. It's all piling on, and some of your own choices could be starting to raise eyebrows. Let's face it, these days, when the world comes calling, you'd really rather not pick up. Your mind, blown. Your spirit, broken. And your body is not taking any of this all that well. Something's just not how you remember. And that something could, in fact, be you. Hey, it's a struggle. We understand that. Doesn't mean it's too late for a change. We're here. We get it. And we have ideas for how to find a better way. Check us out. Traumastewardship.com Okay. Just a quick thing to kind of help us realize, and, and, and I think sometimes laugh at ourselves, the, the reality of the secondary trauma and the impacts of that are real. And we have to pay attention to that. Um, it is what ends up leading to turnover in organizations and is one of the, the hazards of working in this, in this trait, in this field. Some of the secondary risk, the, the risk factors of secondary trauma we see that our own personal trauma, which we know is higher in people who work in these kind of areas. But I think especially now with the COVID, isolation, overwork, high case loads, working with people that are even experiencing more traumatization, this is an especially important time to pay attention to how we're reacting to things and some of the things that we need to do to be able to take care of ourselves so we can be that person that helps build the resilience within our, within our clients. And so a couple of the protective factors, um, just thinking about how am I cultivating relationships? How am I staying connected to people? Um, how am I taking care of my own factors? Um, and within the organization, offering livable wages, providing supports for people, opportunities to connect when we're disconnected. All of these things are important for us to be able to think about moving forward and being able to continue to do this work. I guess I wanna just leave you with one last quote from Maya Angelou that I think is helpful. You know, every day offers us 10,000 reasons to cry, but if we can find just one reason to laugh, we'll be all right. Um, and that's what we need to do to be able to take care of ourselves in these difficult times. So I appreciate you uh, taking some time to think about things, think about how this applies to your organization, um, how you can be that resilience builder for your clients and how you can take care of yourself, especially now in, in these challenging days. Um, we've got just a minute or so left, a couple minutes. Um, if anyone has any final thoughts or things they'd like to share um, from this, we've got about a minute. And that's okay. We've had some great people that have shared stories and uh, we are coming to the end. So I just wish you well in all of your work and I appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you today. So have a great rest of your summit. Thank you, Mary Beth. This session will now close.